This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not medical care or advice. Clinicians should rely on their own medical judgments when advising their patients. Patients in need of medical care should consult their personal care provider. Welcome to That's Pediatrics, where we sit down with physicians, scientists, and experts to discuss the latest discoveries and innovations in pediatric health care. Hi, I'm Allie Williams, a pediatric hospitalist here at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. I'm Samir Agnihotri, an assistant professor in the Department of Neurological Surgery. And today we are so thrilled to join us on That's Pediatrics podcast, Dr. Stephanie Green. She is one of our wonderful pediatric neurosurgeons here at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. And honestly, she wears quite a few different hats that we're looking forward to talking with her about today. Thanks so much for being here. My favorite thing to do when we always start a podcast is to ask, what's your favorite thing about the Pittsburgh area? I think my favorite thing about the Pittsburgh area is how accessible it is for families. There's great schools. There are parks all over the place. There's all sorts of free things to do with your kids. The Science Center, they have um, at the symphony, they have a program called Fiddlesticks where little kids can go and try out the instruments. And then when they make noise during the performance, nobody cares because everybody else brought their little kids. Yeah. Um, So I like all that kind of stuff about Pittsburgh. I mean, I think we're all a little biased. I I also love the Science Center with my kids. It's a great place that I can try to instill medicine into them nice and early. Exactly. (laughs) So not only being busy at home with kids, you also have a lot of different hats that you wear here at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Can you talk a little bit about your, um, your career journey to getting to where you are today? Oh, sure. Um, I guess uh, you want to start in childhood. I wanted to be a doctor since my pediatrician told me that I didn't want to be a nurse. (laughs) (laughs) I got really into the books about the pioneer nurses, Clara Barton and Florence Nightingale, and I wanted to be on the battlefield saving soldiers' lives. And my pediatrician told me that was really more of a doctor job nowadays. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so, true. Yeah, wow, the history. So since I was, I mean, that's pretty good. Right in the mid-70s, my male pediatrician told the little girl to become a doctor. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty good. But um, I got interested in neuroscience after a head injury in high school. I was in a car accident mm-hmm. and in a coma for a period of time. And then I lost some skills. I was the point guard on my basketball team. And six months later, I couldn't dribble a ball. Oh my gosh. And it took me about wow. a year to get back to normal. And I just wanted to figure out how that happened and why. So that was my neuroscience interest. Um, so I was a neuroscience major. I went to Dartmouth College. And then I thought I'd become a neurologist because how else would you figure that out? Sure. And then I discovered that the neurologists were really more diagnosticians and they weren't fixers. And somehow it never really crossed my mind that I played the piano and I knitted. And when my family bought a gas grill, I put it together and I really was a fixer. So I was won over by a neurosurgeon during my neurology rotation. I suppose pediatric neurosurgery came later. So our training is seven years of adult neurosurgery and then we subspecialize in pediatric neurosurgery. And I loved every rotation. I wanted to do everything. I didn't want to eliminate anything, but I wanted to be in academics. And the only way to stay in academics and do everything is to do it on little people. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. So that's the pediatric piece. So that came at the end of residency. So I did my fellowship. I did my residency in Boston at Boston Children's and Brigham and Women's. And I did my fellowship in Seattle at Seattle Children's. And then I started elsewhere in my career, and it wasn't the perfect job for me. And then I wound up in Pittsburgh, which has been the perfect job for me. That's amazing. Um, You're also in the process of creating a neurovascular center, correct? Correct. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what that's going to look like? Sure. Um, Within neurosurgery, um, vascular neurosurgery has always been my passion. I love the moya moya and the arteriovenous malformations. Um, I love cavernous malformations. So we've got a fairly good sized practice of vascular cases here. Um, But I noticed some of these patients need endovascular treatment and not every place has pediatric endovascular capability. We do. Um, There are a few others around the country, but there's no real established pediatric neurovascular center of excellence. 
They have the pieces in a couple of programs around the country, but nobody markets themselves as a, a sort of a one-stop shop where you can get your diagnostic angiogram. You could get gamma knife treatment if you needed mm -hmm. it. You can have open surgery. You can have endovascular treatment. So um, we're working together with hospital administration to establish this center. We're working on formulating the website right now. Um, we're publishing papers on vascular neurosurgery in children, um, trying to up our profile so that we'll be uh, attracting patients on a national level. That's amazing. Um, can you also highlight, because you have so many hats, uh, talk a little bit about the, the fetal uh, neurosurgery program as well. Sure. Um, we established a fetal program for uh, spina bifida about, it's probably about eight years ago now. So we've done a few surgeries. We do them over at McGee because at that stage of pregnancy, the mother is really the patient. Sure. They've got a NICU right. at McGee, um, but we don't have the ability to take care of adult women at children's. So the surgeries sure. are done over there together with the maternal fetal medicine specialists. And um, sort of sprouting out of that endeavor was a research project looking at infants with aqueductal stenosis. That's a condition that develops pretty early in gestation, and they develop hydrocephalus, the buildup of fluid above the blockage. So their heads just get bigger, and the brain damage becomes cumulative until that's treated, which is conventionally after birth. Usually the babies are delivered by C-section because their heads are so large by the time that they're at term. So it's tougher on the mother as well. Sure. So um, we started thinking about ways to treat that in utero, and we've come up with a ventriculoamniotic shunt. So it shunts cerebrospinal fluid from the ventricles in the brain out into the amniotic cavity to normalize the pressure. There's a little valve, so they don't drain too much. It's one way, so the fluid in the amniotic cavity doesn't get into the ventricle. That would be bad. It seems it's, important. <laughs> <laughs> it's low profile because babies will reach up and pull things off of themselves. So yeah. there are a lot of pieces to this. Um, so Dr. Emery from Maternal Fetal Medicine, Dr. Chun from the School of Engineering and I came up with this uh, fetal shunt. We've got a couple of patents for it now as we've gone through revisions. Exactly. And we're getting close to applying to be able to use it on a humanitarian use basis through the FDA. Wow. And is this a device that's envisioned to be used in utero while the child develops to not only like, to well, I guess to prevent, of course, the sequelae that occurs from the brain damage, but it's not, I assume, a permanent device. You would still potentially need the shunt afterwards, but it would lead to better outcomes for the patient and for the mom, potentially. Is that kind of the idea? Correct. It's pretty well established that the ventricular enlargement produces tearing of the axons around the ventricles, which leads to cerebral palsy, seizures, developmental delay. So if we can prevent that, right. it's a better neurologic outcome for the baby. But this, we obviously don't want to be draining cerebrospinal fluid out into the air postnatally. Um, so they'll have to be treated with either an endoscopic third ventriculostomy or a ventricular peritoneal shunt shortly after birth. That is, I, I, I'm at a loss for words as to how amazing that is because, I mean, we are seeing here at UPMC Children's Hospital of right. Pittsburgh, we have such a wide variety of patients that we see, but we do see plenty of patients that have had these in utero experiences that lead to complications throughout their, you know, their, the entirety of their lives, not only through pediatrics, but as they get older as well, like you mentioned, they have developmental delay and they have, um, other other issues as well, sometimes epilepsy, things like that. So um, thinking about preventing that is um, not to do a bad pun, but it is mind-blowing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I'm switching gears a little bit and, and just to embarrass you a little bit, you are a thought leader, a role model, and I have had the privilege of having three amazing female medical students, uh, one that's gone on to do neurosurgery, two that look up to you. Can you speak to uh, the responsibility and being a role model as a, as a woman in your surgery? Well, well, thank you <laughs> for the kind words. It is, now I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there are not a lot of women in neurosurgery. Um, right now I'm the only woman in the department, although I know we have just recently recruited another woman who's going to be based at Passivant. Uh, she hasn't started yet, but I'm excited about that. 
Um, I think the most important thing that I can do for people that are thinking about it is just be. I think they need to see that there are women doing this and it makes it seem possible. Um, but I'm grateful to hear that there are some medical students looking up to me. That's nice to hear. I'm pretty involved with the medical students in my role as vice chair of education. I'm trying to meet with them all regularly to help them be as competitive as they can through the neurosurgery match. So I'm aware of more female medical students than I have encountered in the past, which is great. I mean, you had even mentioned through your childhood, you had a good experience of your male pediatrician saying, you know, well, you should be a doctor if that's what you want to do. Um, and not everyone has those experiences. And we know there's plenty of research to show that there is still um, gender disequity when it comes to specializations that um, medical students choose. What do you think are some of the barriers to women um, being more involved in neurosurgery? For sure, I've had some great male role models. Um, it doesn't require just female role models. No. My father says there's no feminist like a father of daughters. <laughs> that is I, true. I think he's right. Yeah, my chairman of neurosurgery at the Brigham had daughters in medicine, and he was a gigantic feminist. You know, I think um, the men are important too. Yeah, absolutely. Barriers. I think um, it helps people to see people like them in the field. I think that's certainly true. I think that a seven-year residency sounds intimidating to an awful lot of people. Sure. Maybe more so if they're not sure they'd be welcomed. Um, I think people should be considering if they go into pediatrics or medicine and then they do a fellowship that's going to wind up being the same length of time as their neurosurgery residency. But we don't want everybody to go into neurosurgery. We want the people to go into neurosurgery that love it, that don't want to do anything else. Right. Because right. it's hard. You know, if, if you were deciding between neurosurgery and dermatology at three in the morning in the emergency room, you might decide to twitch, switch fields. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I think every field has their challenges. I know neurosurgery, at least for me as a medical student, was very intimidating to think about. <laughs> It's not for people that like a low-stress existence. That's definitely true. <laughs> but one of the cool things about neurosurgery, as I've been told, is you guys love your toys, right? So putting on your like future thinking hat, how do you envision the field uh, changing in the next five, maybe 10 years? You know, one of my favorite things about neurosurgery is that I knew I was always going to keep learning. You never know everything because the field is advancing so fast, not just understanding, but also technology. Um, here we got an intraoperative MRI a few years ago, which helps us with tumors where the borders are indistinct. So we can get an MRI while the patient is still under anesthesia and say, I think we could take a little bit more in this area and improve their outcomes. That's really helped us. Um, we have an intraoperative CT scanner, which helps us um, accurately position screws when we're doing spinal fusions. Um, that's probably the main thing that we use it for. So we've, we've got a laser that we use to ablate lesions that are in surgically inaccessible areas. So we have some pretty great toys already. Um, I think the possibilities are endless in terms of technology. The advances are, are coming like crazy. We all would love to see advances in the development of uh, ventricular peritoneal shunts for hydrocephalus because mm -hmm. they have so many problems and it's real cumbersome on the families to have malfunctions. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's lots of research going on all the time with self-clearing valves and that sort of stuff, but that there's nothing earth shattering that has happened on that front yet. Uh, but the technology is changing all the time and that's one of the really great things about neurosurgery. Right. There's just so many things that we've talked about that have been so exciting so far. Do you have, I mean, you, you've talked about your neurovascular center that's coming up. Is there a timeline on when that might develop at all? You said it's in the future, but I don't know if we should expect that soon, or is that still in like early stages for that? We're very close. The website will probably be up and running within a month, and it will have contact information for you know people all over the country to call into a, a specific number. So I think about a month away, um, we've already got clinic time where the vascular neurologists are there at the same time as me and the endovascular surgeons. So mm -hmm. we'll um, be able to see patients together as they come. And I'm just going to move my patients that I see in my regular clinic into the vascular center. 
as it becomes um, as it, there becomes room for them. Right. Yeah. Speaking of the other hats that you wear, you do a lot of amazing research, and you're a scientist. Can you share with us uh, some some things that are coming down in the pipeline, or some things that you publish or are working on that you're really passionate about? Um. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of compliments today. <laughs> Um, I've got papers coming out having to do with uh, the outcomes of cavernous malformations in children. That's a vascular malformation that's reasonably common in adults and kids, but there's not great data on outcomes in a large series. So I think we'll have the largest series to date when it comes out, um, just to help patients and families have a little better understanding of what the future holds. Um, we just had a manuscript come out on our ventricular amniotic shunt. Um, we've got proof of concept with that, so that's very exciting. Um, other things coming down the pipeline, we've got some research on spina bifida, looking at um, how nerve monitoring has changed the outcomes of surgery for tethered cord syndrome, which is something these children develop later in life. So the data that we use to tell families what their outcomes are likely to be after a tethered cord release is based on numbers from before the advent of neurophysiology monitoring in the operating room. So the historical numbers are that a third of patients improve with surgery, a third of patients stay the same with surgery, and a third of patients are worse with surgery. And I think it's in reality, it's not close to that anymore. With the use of nerve monitoring, the outcomes are much more favorable than having a 33% chance of worsening. So um, we should have that paper submitted within two months. So oh, we've got lots of stuff moving through. Wow, that is that is so exciting with all of your different hats and just to, you know, inflate your ego some more and make you blush <laughs> a little bit more on this podcast. And um, we have a lot of trainees that listen to this. We have um, residents, we have medical students that are listening to this. Do you have any words of wisdom for those that are um, thinking about either, you know, um, pursuing neurosurgery specifically or even just um, maybe a field of medicine that is not predominantly uh, with women in it, kind of, you know, an underrepresented um, gender. Do you have any words of wisdom for those folks that might be looking for it? Yeah, I think, you know, we devote so much time for our, to our education that we really should pursue our passion. You shouldn't settle for something because it's almost as good as what you want to do. You need to do the thing that you love, which makes work not feel like work. And I think everybody responds to passion. If you're passionate about this field and you're the only woman that's in your group, everybody wants you there. If you're the one that's the most passionate or one of the most passionate, you're welcomed if this is important to you. Everybody recognizes themselves in that. And I don't think we could look for any other stronger advice than that. That right. is, that, I mean, those are words to live by. And so we are so thankful that you were able to come today and take some time out of your busy schedule um, to put your hats on the hat rack just for a minute so you could talk all about them as opposed right. to wearing them. Um, so thank you again for coming and talking with us today. And thank you for listening to That's Pediatrics. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having Thank you so much. Thank that you. was great. You can find other episodes of That's Pediatrics on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. For more information about this podcast or our guests, please visit chp.edu slash that's pediatrics. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to keep up with our new content. You can also email us at podcast.upmc at gmail.com with any feedback or ideas for topics you'd like our experts to cover on future episodes. Thank you again for listening to That's Pediatrics. Tune in next time.